Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Dr. Harsh Chaturvedi, uh, welcoming you on behalf of Pulse Pharmaceuticals and Ortho TV to a very exciting evening where we are going to debate and understand on the usage of anticoagulants with emphasis on apixaban in, uh, in trauma. Uh, we have uh, two very experienced faculty members with us in uh, Dr. Vidya Nand Rao from Mumbai and Dr. Hari Krishna uh, from Hubli. Uh, before I invite them uh, or to start their deliberations, I would request uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Pampa Ghosh, to play the corporate video so you get a brief introduction to Pulse Pharmaceuticals. It is over to you, Pampa. Can you please play the video? Pulse, a true reflection of the heart and its functioning. A heart that is compassionate about others and passionate about its work. A heart that is dynamic yet consistent. A heart that is predictable and reliable. A heart that goes the extra mile to deliver what is expected. Our business philosophy encompasses these very principles. At Pulse Pharma, we feel patients' problems, think, innovate, and do everything that it takes to deliver cost-effective solutions. We have a well-aligned leadership team and a highly motivated functional team to carry out our mission. We innovate and develop products with unique functional characteristics that help us serve our customers' needs better. We develop innovative business processes that help us improve our efficiency and customer experience. We have world-class infrastructure that includes an integrated R&D center and three manufacturing facilities that help us develop and manufacture high-quality differentiated products. Our research efforts are focused on developing nanotherapeutics, nutri-therapeutics and cell therapeutics. Our operational presence is spread across India and 40 countries worldwide. We reach out to nearly 2,50,000 healthcare professionals in various specialties through our sales team of over a thousand people and our partner sales force in various countries. At Pulse, we work with a real spirit of Pulse to bring about a positive difference in millions of lives. Because we are compassionate about people and passionate about our work. Uh, thank you, Pompa, for playing that uh, lovely video. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have a brief uh, presentation and I have a very pleasurable duty of uh, int introducing the faculty today. So without much ado, I start my presentation. I welcome you again on uh, uh, Pompa, is my slide visible? Hello? Uh, sir, it's uh, all uh, dark, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming. It's come. It's come. Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, we have two very eminent uh, orthopedic surgeons, one in Dr. Hari Krishna from Hubli and uh, then Dr. Vidya Nan Raut from uh, Mumbai. Uh, I'm sure many of you would know Dr. Hari Krishna is he is uh, currently practicing at Sri Balaji Hospital at Ubli. He's a graduate of Dr. NTR University of Health Sciences, uh, Andhra Pradesh, and a postgraduate from uh, Jipma, Pondicherry. He has had fellowships in arthroscopy and joint replacement of knee and shoulder at Bhatia Hospital, Mumbai. He has about 11 years of experience in orthopedic surgery. Is the first certified regenerative orthopedic surgeon in North Karnataka, done first knee joint cartilage transplantation in North Karnataka, and is a member of Indian Arthroscopic Society. I welcome you, Dr. Hari Krishna. Thank uh, you. For this evening, of uh, a very exciting evening, I must say. Uh, we also have uh, with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vidyanand Rao, uh, who is consultant orthopedic surgeon and joint replacement surgeon at Mumbai. Dr. Rauth is a graduate and a postgraduate from St. G.S. Medical College in Gain Hospital, Mumbai. He has been recipient of numerous fellowships and trainings in joint replacement from India, Australia, and U.S. He has more than 24 years of experience in orthopedic surgery. 
He is a frequent lecturer in clinical meetings and symposia. He is adept at performing primary and revision THR and TKR. He has been an author, co-author in many papers and publications in both uh, national and uh, international journals. And he has been awarded many awards and accreditations for his uh, work in this field. I welcome you, Dr. Rao, uh, uh, to this evening, uh, where you can you will be sharing your thoughts on the use of uh, apixaban in, uh, 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 in orthopedic surgery. Before I go on, uh, uh, I have a brief presentation on Pulse Pharmaceuticals. Uh, as you have seen in the video, it's a patient-centric, innovation-driven, integrated pharmaceutical company uh, with a with a in inclusive growth model. We have been in there for 26 years across India and the emerging markets, and we have started making uh, initial forays in uh, European and the US markets. We have world-class R&D and manufacturing infrastructure. We have strong leadership team and operational teams across all business functions. We uh, cater to about eight specialties at the moment, including the orthopedics and the neurology. Uh, we are leading in the space of nanopharmaceuticals and drug delivery research. One of flagship brands is Dexel. Uh, we have strong presence in medical nutrition through our sister concern, which is Pulse Nutri Sciences. And uh, we are following an immunocell therapeutics by developing novel CAR T technologies. For this, we are working with the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, which is a CSIR setup based at Hathotel. Our business philosophy is we create customer value through high quality differentiated products and services by, by using advanced uh, technologies, proprietary technologies that we, we have. Our research and manufacturing infrastructure is spread across the states of Telangana and Uttarakhand. Uh, we have uh, existing three plants for manufacturing uh, various pharmaceuticals and nutrition, uh, nutrition products. And we have two R&Ds. We are coming up with uh, another plant and the R&D at the Genome Valley uh, based at Hyderabad. We have been recipients of Udyog Bharti Award, uh, Hall of Fame Award, National Award for Quality Excellence, and India's small giant, uh, the SME Forum Association and NDTV Award. So these are some of the awards uh, that we have received. With these words, uh, I thank you for listening to me patiently. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Hari Krishna to uh, start the deliberations. He will be talking, ladies, student, ladies and gentlemen, on anti use of anticoagulants in trauma. It is over to you, Dr. Hari Krishna. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And... Uh... Uh, I want to talk on the role of anticoagulants in orthopedic trauma. As uh, India is growing, the population is becoming more and more. Uh, we are seeing lots of complicated trauma patients and the ICU care is increasing and we are seeing lots of patients with uh, thromboembolism. So, next slide. So, why in trauma patients? Uh, why, why, why the requirement of the anticoagulants is the need of the heart? Because in all trauma patients, uh, there will be endothelial damage to the organs and there will be a blood clot formation Then there can be a fracture hematoma. And these are all leads to uh, venous thromboembolism. Next slide. Next. So uh, coming to the Vico triad, the Vico triad as described in 1884, uh, to develop a venous thromboembolism, there should be, uh, these three are the main factors which causes uh, VTE. Uh, so the first is the vascular endothelial damage and the stasis of the blood flow and the hypercoagulability of the blood. So anything to form a thrombus and uh, after the injury to the lower limbs, especially in orthopedic uh, injuries, which are uh, more prone for DVTs. So these are the three things which are already common things which are happens automatically when there is a fracture, there can be uh, automatically there is endothelial damage. Uh, there is a blood clot because of the vessel rupture. So the stasis of the blood is there and uh, because of the hypercoagulability state, there is a chance of uh, uh, more uh, development of VTE. Next. So the venous thromboembolism is a serious complication during and after hospitalization, but yet it is a preventable cause of in-hospital death. So without VTE prophylaxis, the overall uh, venous thromboembolism incidence in medical and general surgical hospitalized patients is in the range of 10 to 40%. While it ranges up to 40 to 60 percent in major orthopedic surgeries. So, with routine uh, venous thromboembolic prophylaxis, fatal pulmonary embolism is uncommon in orthopedic patients, and the rates of symptomatic VTE within three months 
are in the range of 1.3 to 10 percent means we almost decrease to 50 percent if we start VTE prophylaxis in these patients because these are the patients are very very prone for VTE. Uh, next slide. See coming to this data, uh, this is very important data where uh, in day-to-day -day life practices, uh, DVT is seen in every patient almost in general surgery practice, in traumatic patients, in cancer patients, in neurosurgical patients, in general surgery patients. C coming to the orthopedic trauma, it's almost 30 to 60 percent. The all recent uh, articles tells that it's almost 30 to 60 percent chance of developing uh, 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 VTE and risk of DVT after the orthopedic trauma. And uh, it, if it compares to the TKR as well as THR, it's also almost it's 50 to 60 percent. Means almost if 100 patients undergo knee replacement, the chance of 50 percent of developing uh, uh, VTE. And uh, coming to the spinal cord injury, it's almost 80 percent because they usually they'll be bedridden, and uh, post traumatic there will be paraplegia, loss of lower limb function. So there is no blood flow in the lower limbs. So there is 80 percent chance of developing uh, DVT in acute spinal cord injuries. Uh, coming to the ischemic strokes, already know it's 55%, cancer is 50%. So uh, today's talk is more on orthopedic trauma. So it is 30 to 60% chance of developing DVT. So there is a need of the heart that every patient of the orthopedic trauma to be subjected to the anticoagulants, uh, depending upon the risk of the patient, which we come to the subsequent slides. Next slide. So in an orthopedic patient who is undergoing any operation compared to if you want to do a knee replacement, uh, we, we use a tourniquet and usually and if you are doing it, interlock nailing of the tibia after the tibia fracture, we use a tourniquet. So this causes uh, is, uh, automatically the blood stasis there. And uh, we immobilize the patient after uh, surgery for in a slab or something for uh, three to four weeks post surgery. And uh, we give some people for the trochanter fractures. We advise them because it's so much osteoporotic. We advise them bed rest. So there is a chance of venous blood stasis in these patients. And uh, usually when we are doing uh, uh, hemiarthroplasties or knee replacements, we'll manipulate the limb. We'll, we, we move the limb flexion, extension, check the gaps in the in the post-TKR. So these are the things where which causes endothelial vascular injuries because in the uh, if you're doing hemiarthroplasty or other surgery, there is chance of uh, moving the limbs uh, uh, to and fro. So there is a chance of endothelial vascular injuries in these patients. And automatically the trauma itself increases the thromboplastin agents. And uh, uh, we see a lot uh, of... Uh, Sometimes uh, we have seen lots of deaths also following uh, cement implantation post uh, hip replacement because of the cement syndrome. So this is also one of the cause of hypercoagulability. So therefore, in patients undergoing orthopedic surgery and those with orthopedic trauma, BT prophylaxis and adherence to the prospective guidelines is paramount important. Next slide. So what is the most optimal VT prophylaxis in patients with multiple orthopedic injuries? So today I want to discuss that, okay, uh, a patient with multiple orthopedic injuries a patient of head injury with orthopedic trauma, a patient of vas vas visceral injury with orthopedic trauma, uh, especially uh, uh, related to trauma in orthopedics. So these are the four concern areas where we have a dilemma so that, okay, whether we should start VTE prophylaxis or not. So VTE events following multiple orthopedic injuries associated with significant morbidity and mortality. The prevalence of DVT in trauma patients without prophylactic treatments can reach up to 60%. So the pulmonary embolism in, in all this, in 60% of these VTE patients, there is almost 16% they are going to develop fatal pulmonary embolism. It's very, very high. And these patients are very, very uh, high risk patients who are going to die. So we should prevent these patients from developing PE. And first point, we should stop VTE so that we can prevent PE. So there is a need of the art that we should start all these traumatic uh, orthopedic injuries uh, with the VTE prophylaxis. Next slide. So uh, what uh, prophylaxis we should uh, advise in multiple orthopedic injuries? The LMWH, no microbial hepatitis, is considered the most optimal VT prophylaxis in patients with multiple orthopedic injuries. Uh, Leatal in his study recommends using LMWH due to the increased bioavailability, acceptability, acceptability, low bleeding complications, and longer plasma life. Roger et al. published in their uh, guidelines for prevention of VT in trauma patients that LMWH is safer. And uh, Leatal also uh, uh, advised in pharmacological devices should be started as soon as possible within 24 hours after the injury. Next slide. So usually sometimes uh, we see a patient who already developed DVT, uh, we, but we want to do a surgery. So usually we'll advise inferior vena cover filters. Uh, uh, and if you want uh, to prevent uh, uh, DVT uh, to go up to uh, the pulmonary, should not become pulmonary embolism. So uh, uh, inferior vena cover filters are usually used in big centers where we uh, uh, lots of DVT patients are there and this can prevent easily the pulmonary embolism. So it has been established role as an adjunct to LMWH in patients with DVT to prevent PE. However, multiple studies recommend the use of IVC filters to be reserved for patients who cannot receive any form of prophylaxis or patients undergoing urgent surgery. Next slide. 
so uh, coming to the vt prophylaxis in polytrauma with fractures as well as visceral injuries so in patients with fractures and visceral injuries anticoagulant based thromboflaxis should be recommended as soon as bleeding risk allows and uh, usually bilateral mechanical thromboprophylaxis this is important and uh, usually every cent big centers in india now they are getting all dvd pumps and uh, it is the paramount important that every patient post surgical to be applied both dvd pumps to the bilateral lower limb which is called pneumatic pumps as uh, well as uh, sequential compressive devices so this automatically uh, in, uh, decreases chances of vte uh, next so coming to the pelvic injury patients because this we, uh, we see regularly in our uh, high end trauma centers where uh, patients of pelvic injuries uh, already they will be bleeding inside but in this patient whether we should give vte prophylaxis or not so there is a big study which was done which is around 2752 patients uh, in severe pelvic uh, fractures commencement of anti uh, thrombo thrombo prophylaxis within 48 hours after the admission was associated with a 49% decrease in vte it's always significantly decrease vte a five fold lower pulmonary embolism rate and reduce mortality with no bleeding complications compared to the later commencement so as early as possible if you think that there is bleeding has been stopped then immediately commence uh, the patient uh, introduce the uh, anti thrombolytic uh, prophylaxis so every pelvic injury patient they are very very highly prone for the uh, vte so we should stop a vte to uh, to become pe so every patient of pelvic injury to be given thrombo prophylaxis next so the visceral organ injuries so then there is a spleen injury we see we this is see liver injuries we see kidney injuries so usually nowadays usually they are mostly treated by the non operatively because usually it takes the 30 24 to 48 hours for the observation so anti coagulant thrombo prophylaxis started within 48 hours after the blunt solid organ injury in addition to if there is no lower limb fractures if there is a trochanter fracture if there are upper limb fractures apply sequential compressive devices uh, so, so that it uh, decreases the dvt rate the american college of surgeons uh, tqip database was assessed to identify there is a very big number large number 36187 patients with non operative solid organ injury with uh, 14 48 hours at significantly fewer dvt and pe than those who started later with no increase of bleeding complications or transfusion so even in visceral organ injuries it is advisable after 48 hours if you feel that there is no further bleeding happening after usg of the uh, abdomen if you see that there is no further bleeding better to start uh, vvt prophylaxis in even in visceral organ injuries next slide so uh, 2021 ast guidelines recommend that lmw start within 48 hours after a solid organ injury if there is evidence that active bleeding has been stopped so this is based on multiple studies showing no increase in bleeding with early initiation of anticoagulant thromboprophylaxis in patients with solid organ injury even we start lmw also there is very very less chance of bleeding because uh, uh, already we seen of 24 to 48 hours of observation that there is no further bleeding is happening next slide so coming to the spine fractures which which is already we discussed is 80% chance of developing dvt uh, so dvt is a blood clot located in uh, more uh, extremities and especially in the spinal cord injury that can lead to a pulmonary embolism sudden death and chronic thrombophilic swelling the frequency of dvt and pe without prophylaxis without prophylaxis based on so many clinical data so almost 12 to 64% range uh, the, the prospective study which was done in hospital series where there is a 21 per to 26 81% of the patient with acute spinal cord injury has developed dvt which did not get a uh, prophylaxis next point so despite the recent advancements in the managing of the dvt spinal cord injury patients treated with appropriate prophylaxis in the acute phase of the traumatic injury have a mortal rate of 9.7% which is very very high due to the pulmonary embolism uh, during the first year after the spinal cord injury a thrombi can progress proximally in 20% of the cases and may embolize in up to 50% especially in spinal cord injury patients so every patient of a spinal cord injury like a traumatic spine injuries which includes uh, dorsal spine lumbar spine cervical spine when they all, if, if if they are paraplegic or not paraplegic if they are neurologically intact also there is a chance of developing dvt because we advise immobilization for some time so we should ad advise them venous thrombo prophylaxis should be continued uh, for these patients in a, uh, it is essential that aggressive thromboprophylaxis provided to sub, uh, spinal cord injury patients is very very important along with dvt pumps which are sequential compressive devices see uh, sequential compressive devices should be applied to every patient if there is no lower limb fracture because it provides a mechanical uh, 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 prophylaxis where the automatic pumping of the calf muscle is started so every patient of a bedridden patient icu patient traumatic patients uh, should be applied with the sequential compressive devices so that uh, it helps in preventing dvt along with chemical prophylaxis next slide 
So, DVD, but coming coming to the children, because sometimes there can be a spinal cord injury in the pediatric age group. Uh, there is less chance in pediatric age group, but as age increases from 13 to 14, there is a chance of 9 percent. From 16 to 20, uh, there is chance of uh, de developing DVT. So, uh, but see again, we should come to the virtual triad only because this is the main cause of de developing VTE. And in spinal cord injury patient also, why patient develop VTE? Because it's again immobile. No blood uh, blood clotting is there, fracture is there, patient is not able to move. So there is again uh, endothelial injury, hypercoagulability, stress. This is one of the co most common cause of DVT. So every spinal cord injury patient should be subjected to anti uh, prophylaxis to prevent VTE, which is very fatal. And uh, most common uh, pulmonary embolism can happen in these patients. Next slide. So coming to the head injury, this is a very big dilemma. I work in a neurosurgery center also. Uh, neurosurgeon will tell no doctor bleeding over a brain may we cannot give. And we used to lose lots of patients. And uh, I used to have a concern. No, why my patients are dying? Because the patient has a neck femur fracture and patient has head injury. Patient is a weak, in already in a weak time. Uh, they have head injury. They operated SDH or something. And they'll tell no doctor we cannot give a DVD prophylaxis because of brain injury. So then I thought, oh, no, no, we should study some these some papers and tell that that we should change the protocol of the every traumatic brain injury patients. Then we came with the, I assessed lots of articles and it clearly mentions that if the a, Every traumatic brain injury patients to be recommended with thrombophrophylaxis as soon as possible, generally within 24 to 72 hours. But, and after CT scan, if you feel of 24 to 48 hours, there is no further bleeding happening. This definitely, I know the risk is there, ble it bleeds. But especially, but the risk of DVT is also very high. And because uh, these patients will be bedridden for a month together, usually traumatic brain injuries, traumatic spine injuries, they're very, very high chance of developing DVTs. So we should, we cannot mobilize them also because they will be in coma sometimes. So the early initiation of LMWS thrombolysis is most uh, uh, important in traumatic brain injury patients. Uh, but uh, you should have a CT scan of 24 hours, 48 hours, 36, 72 hours to see whether there is no further bleeding. Then every patient should be subjected to the uh, uh, anti-thrombolysis, especially LMWS to be given or Apixaban, whichever which is safer to in, in brain injuries. Next slide. Next. So the main barrier to early anticoagulant thrombolysis in patients with is the presence of traumatic brain injury. So a large trauma quality improvement project study, which was done in 2,468 patients uh, with severe tra traumatic brain injuries, used propensity matching of those who has early prophylaxis and late prophylaxis. The early group had a lower risk of pulmonary embolism and DVT without an increase in either mortality or neurosurgical intervention. So these studies tells that as early as possible, less than 72 hours, if, if, if you uh, I subject the patient to the uh, antithrombolytic prophylaxis. We are, there is very, very less risk of pulmonary embolism in these patients. Next slide. So in the only randomized trials addressing the issue, anaxaparin started within 24 hours after the injury in 681 patients in traumatic brain injuries with stable head uh, C CT scan uh, has less chance of developing DVT. Finally, a systemic review of 21 studies. Uh, they told, they, there are 21 systematic reviews which were reviewed by them and they tell that there is no chance of much bleeding if you start or not because there is no hemorrhage in the patients which with anti-thrombolytic prophylaxis. So the timing is also not much a concern. You can give 24 hours also or 48 hours also depending upon the bleeding risk. If you feel that there is no further bleeding in the brain happen after 48 hours, better to start them on a DVT prophylaxis. Next slide. So concerning with the VT, uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, every major orthopedic surgery to be sub, uh, given uh, antithrombolytic prophylaxis. So what are major orthopedic surgeries? What are minor orthopedics are uh, non-major? So major usually is uh, a patient of every lower limb fractures or all uh, major uh, major orthopedic surgeries means pelvic fracture, trochanter fracture, distal femur fractures. Uh, so these are all patients, TKR, THR. Uh, uh, these are all patients which are having very, very high chance of developing uh, DVT, even tibia fracture also. Uh, recently, I had a patient referred from some doctor who has uh, done arthroscopic meniscus repair. Uh, patient developed PE on second day. The patient traveled after uh, 24 to 48 hours in uh, after the surgery and uh, patient developed PE. It's very, very rare in arthroscopy surgeries. But still, because of doing microfracture, maybe I don't know the patient developed PE. Uh, still, there is a chance of an arthroscopic surgery. Also, there is a chance of developing DVT. Next slide. So... So the arthroscopic surgeries, upper limb surgery and below ankle fractures are considered as non-major surgeries where usually no need to give any uh, DVT prophylaxis. Uh, but uh, if you feel that uh, surgery's uh, time is more, two, three hours, and patient is immob require immobilization, so in this arthroscopic surgery also, you should uh, subject the patient after 24 hours uh, uh, with the VT prophylaxis. Next slide. 
so this is a caprini score for dvt so every uh, after surgery if you feel that patient require a dvt prophylaxis you can use this score and if, if it is total score is 0 to 4 uh, there is patient comes under low category uh, high risk uh, patient if the score is more than 9 patient is comes under high risk category so any major surgery you more than 6 hours usually there is a points of 5 so if it's more than 5 to 8 moderate you better to start on dvt prophylaxis next slide so the, what are the recommendations are so what we recommend for all patients recommend early fixation of unstable fractures to reduce pain promote mobility and decrease uh, to decrease vte if fracture repair will be delayed it is recommended that lnwh prophylaxis to not be delayed at all since missed anticoagulant doses are associated with increased risk of vte this should be avoided unless it is essential next slide so the recommendation is that every polytrauma patient been evaluated on admission for both bleeding and thrombosis so patient with active bleeding are usually managed surgically or by endovascular immobilization the recommendation is anticoagulant thrombolysis be delayed until the high bleeding risk resolves once there is evidence that there is no active bleeding the recommended anticoagulant thrombolysis generally with uh, lmwh in general within 24 hours after the injury is advisable next slide so the early mobility and daily physiotherapy should also be encouraged for example in increased risk of dvt was seen after spinal injuries so uh, early mobilization along with sequential compressive devices is very very important to decrease vte the duration of thromboprophylaxis in polytrauma usually is uncertain usually everybody recommends up to the hospital stay uh, in tkt hr it differs depending upon in, in, in knee replacement up to 14 days in thr it should be given for 30 days so patient undergoing in inpatient rehabilitation the recommendation is to continue thromboprophylaxis with either a direct anticoagulant or with lmwh because these are the patients which are prone late prone for the dvts because of more immobilization uh, which are patients are staying in uh, months together in icu which require more uh, rehabilitation next slide so the patient with a high risk of bleeding the recommended is starting so if a patient has a brain, inju brain injury if a patient has abdominal bleeding so better this patient at least apply sequential compressive devices uh, so that uh, before starting uh, lmwh or other uh, uh, anticoagulants at least sequential compressive devices to be applied to all patients if there is no lower limb fractures means you can exclude the lower limb fracture site next slide so the recommendation is to use standard vt prophylaxis policies embedded uh, in routine order sets as well as periodic audits of the adherence to reduce unnecessary variability in practice and improve patient outcomes in including vt next slide so does aspirin prevent dvt this is a slide which is important uh, i feel uh, to uh, keep on two three slides because uh, I, i also used to use aspirin uh, post uh, tkr thr in some patients and all, all patients are doing well but uh, but uh, whether there is, it's it's really important that aspirin has a role yes definitely but it's not a drug of choice for diagnosed case of vte because once vte is diagnosed then it's not a drug of choice we should start them on anti thrombolytic prophylaxis but patients who are high risk for developing vte and who already developed vte the drug of choice is anticoagulant definitely because if the patient is very high risk aspirin alone cannot prevent dvt so aspirin is a definitely a drug of choice for dvt in so many studies it is told that uh, it it can be given but when the patient is having high risk of chance of developing dvt then definitely the drug of choice is not aspirin you should start them on uh, anticoagulant whether lmwh or apixaban whatever try so thrombin inhibitors are preferred anticoagulants in post tkr and thr patients there is a, in some studies quotes that 80% risk in uh, the patients with aspirin compared to anticoagulants and there is a 40% increase in mortality in aspirin compared to the anticoagulants group which are high risk patients not a normal patient if the patient is high risk patient better to subject them on or uh, no uh, anticoagulants not an aspirin because these patients are very prone more prone for uh, uh, dvts so better to start them on uh, anti uh, thromboagulants uh, than aspirin tablet next slide so uh, there is a nice guidelines which was uh, in 2018 which clearly tells that especially in the elderly group the aspirin should not be the choice especially in the fractures around the hip uh, they prefer uh, lmwh as apixaban and uh, thr uh, any aspirin also can be given and tkr especially apixaban is the preferred drug of choice in uh, according to the nice guidelines post tkr uh, in uh, uk so aspirin especially because in elderly group there is a chance of bleeding so uh, they, uh, they they recommend lmwh or apixaban post following fractures around the hip joint uh, but thr usually hip replacement patients are young patients and knee replacement patients are uh, young patients so it's not a problem but especially the trochanter fractures and fractures around the hip the nice guidelines never recommend aspirin it, it recommends uh, apixaban or lmwh or direct thrombin inhibitors but post thr tkr still aspirin is a drug of choice you can give if the patient is very low risk next slide so any questions thank you
Thank you, Dr. Hari Krishna, for a very succinct uh, presentation. Uh, I don't think we, one could have elaborated more on the uh, use of uh, you know anticoagulant uh, prophylaxis. And uh, really, uh, uh, the high point was uh, you can you do weigh the benefit to the risk ratio, and most of the time, the benefits far exceed the risk of bleeding. So yes, uh, uh, and uh, therefore, it is uh, only right that uh, the therapy should be initiated within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and the second high point is many of us still debate between the use of aspirin yes. and uh, an anticoagulant, uh, where it's very clearly signed out uh, uh, in cases of stasis, where we're looking at pooling and stasis, uh, aspirin doesn't have much of a, a role, uh, being more true. of an antiplatelet agent. Uh, so uh, but that's something which was which has always been uh, point of contention. We'll talk about it a bit later. Uh, uh, we'll move on, ladies and gentlemen, to Dr. Vidyanand Rao uh, to uh, hear from his uh, him his experience with the use of epixaban in uh, uh, the trauma. It is over to you, Dr. Rao. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible and my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Yeah. You need to go to the uh, yeah slideshow. Yes, yeah, I got it. That's fine. Go fine. Ahead. Perfect. All right. So, at the outset, I must mention that Dr. Hari Krishna had has very clearly given the message that anticoagulants have a role, an important role in trauma patients as well. The role in THR and TKR is well known. I mean, it's a, almost a medical legal requirement that you have to give uh, DVT prophylaxis in THR and TKR. But what happens in trauma? The most important thing is that trauma patients are not optimized. They have to undergo surgery in a very suboptimal setting, in a semi-urgent setting, especially if the trauma is uh, lower limb trauma or a spine injury, as he said, uh, the some form of anticoagulation has to be given because the patients are immobilized or bedridden for a variable amount of time. So that leads to stasis and hypercoagulability of the blood. So, and already because of the trauma itself and because of the surgical intervention, we have endothelial damage. So we have all the elements of Vergov's triad which are present in a trauma patient. And in a trauma patient, as he said, as Dr. Hari said, 30 to 60 percent incidence of deep vein thrombosis or venous thromboembolism in general, if there is no prophylaxis. So today, what we are going to discuss is we should be giving prophylaxis in trauma patients in major trauma, that is predominantly lower limb trauma and spinal injuries. But we have to formulate some form of guidelines which drug to give, when to give, and what to monitor. Okay, so Dr. Hari Krishna has given a brief overview of all the medications, all the agents that are helpful. Aspirin is helpful in very low risk patients. Low molecular weight hepa heparins are the drug of choice, as uh, pointed out in the study by Lay. And uh, oral anticoagulants are also very useful, very safe and efficacious in most of the situations. My brief is specifically to talk about Apixaban, which is the new kid on the block. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So if you see all the available direct oral anticoagulants, we have Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, and Edoxaban. Dabigatran is a thrombin inhibitor, while all the others are factor 10A inhibitors. Dabigatran has a half-life of around 12 to 14 hours, and all the other uh, factor 10A inhibitors have a variable amount of half-life. Ideal half-life to have is 12 hours, which is uh, seen in apixaban and edoxaban. Renal excretion, Dabigatran has a problem that is major part of the drug is excreted through the kidneys, so, in renal impairment, it cannot be used. And in that sense, if you compare the 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban, you can see that only 25% apixaban is excreted through the kidneys, which means that 
it is safe in moderate mild to moderate renal damage okay now the bleeding tendency if you compare the bleeding tendency there is a significantly higher risk uh, uh, in rivaroxaban com compared to dabigatran and edoxaban if you compare all four of these drugs apixaban scores over everything because it is as efficacious as rivaroxaban and much much safer than any of the other drugs and there is obviously the price advantage which i need not stress upon next slide so these are the pharmacokinetics we need not go into uh, detail uh, dabigatran as i said uh, should not be given in renal compromised patients if the renal function is normal and if the uh, procedure is a low bleeding risk then dabigatran has a role otherwise uh, i would stay away from it next Rivaroxaban has been my favorite for many years. Before Apixaban came on the picture, came into the picture, I used to use Rivaroxaban very frequently for all my THR and TKR cases because it is a factor 10 inhibitors. It acts at the confluence of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways of coagulation, so it it really works where we want it to work. But as efficacious as it is. there is a risk of bleeding more more than bleeding what i would call oozing so typically with rivaroxaban what i was finding that on day 6 or day 7 of surgery patient has gone home and the patient comes back that the dressing is stained and there is slight oozing or weeping from the wound now that puts us in a dilemma as a surgeon is this related to the anticoagulation or is it some sign of infection and if we are not able to differentiate between the two that affects our line of treatment because if there is infection the whole treatment goes in a different direction so it was a boon that apixaban came into the picture which is as efficacious as rivaroxaban now with a significantly lower uh, lower incidence of bleeding post operatively uh, next slide yeah so if the patient is on apixaban already for some cardiac event for some atrial fibrillation or whatever it is the drug should be withheld for about 24 to 48 hours before any planned surgery in low risk bleeding procedures uh, we can continue it i mean uh, even during surgery it doesn't make a difference especially in tkr i operate with a tourniquet on so apixaban even i have operated patients who are already on apixaban and it's absolutely no risk so bleeding during or after surgery but if you have stopped it for some reason then after surgery i would immediately start it within 24 hours after the surgery assuming uh, uh, provided that all uh, hemostasis has been achieved there is no active bleeding and uh, the wound is dry so so i check that the next morning and i start the uh, uh, start up ixaban again next please edoxaban i don't have a personal experience of using that drug it seems to be promising but uh, more or less the pharmacokinetics are similar to apixaban next please okay now there are lot of studies uh, comparing the direct oral anticoagulant agents okay so it's a very busy slide i will just give the gist of it the gist is this that apixaban 2.5 mg twice daily is equally effective as rivaroxaban 10 mg once daily to be given for a period of 14 days after surgery okay so they are both equally effective but apixaban is more safe with respect to the bleeding profile next please so the vt is risk was lower in rivaroxaban in about 50% as compared to clexin or enoxaparin dabigatran 29% as compared to enoxaparin and apixaban about 20% less as compared to enoxaparin so the point i'm trying to make out is that 
low molecular weight hepar, uh, heparin, like um, enoxaparin, they are very convenient to give when the patient is still admitted. And uh, their uh, their safety profile is excellent. So I I like to use Clexen 0.4 milligrams subcutaneously. I give it right on the day of surgery in every patient. A single dose on the day of surgery at 10 p.m. So suppose I operated in the morning, I will give that Clexen at 10 p.m. on that night, and that's it. And from the next morning, I will start on Apixaban. This combination works well. It is uh, it has a sound scientific basis to it. We are not leaving a period of window when the patient is uh, at a risk of developing uh, blood clots. Okay, so the risk of bleeding is lowest in apixaban, even compared with clexin, even compared with enoxaparin, about 18 to 20 percent less. But I like to use clexin uh, or enoxaparin all the same because it can be given as an injection on the day of surgery, where we cannot give oral apixaban because the patient has not yet been started on orals. Next. So, the gist is apixaban is the only oral anticoagulant that shows a decrease in the VT risk as well as a decrease in the risk of bleeding. Next. I think we'll skip this slide as I've spoken about it. So, all the uh, DOACs, that is Debegatran, Apixaban, and Rivaroxaban, which you are considering, reduce the risk of VT compared to a placebo. That's proven. And based on the, all the studies that were discussed, Apixaban is the most favorable in terms of efficacy and safety profiles. However, there has been no direct comparative trials between different types of DOACs. So we cannot actually give a definitive opinion, but this is a matter of um, uh, convenience, availability, and cost factor. All things considered, my choice is Apixaban. In THRT care, and also now what I'm going to talk on is in trauma, in lower limb trauma. Next slide, please. Again. It is safe, efficacious for trauma patient as well. Now, when we get a hip fracture patient and we are doing either a fixation or a hemiarthroplasty, a bipolar, the patient receives the same consideration as if he were undergoing a total hip replacement. So the same safety profile has to be monitored. I would give clexin on the night of surgery. And I would start Apixaban 2.5 milligram BD, that's 12 hourly, next morning uh, after the surgery. So this is my go-to regimen and it has worked with me. The reason is Apixaban is very easily available. It is, uh, um, there is a cost advantage and it can be started immediately. If patient on Apixaban, in a trauma patient and so on, if the patient patient starts uh, showing symptoms of bleeding on the day third or day fourth after surgery, if the patient is still in the hospital, merely stopping a Pixaban is enough. Merely stopping one or two tablets is enough because it has a half-life of only 12 hours. There is absolutely no reason to use the antidote that is reserved in uh, very severe cases of bleeding. I have no personal experience of using Andexin at Alpha. But uh, I think our uh, clinical research team can highlight more on this. Next, please. Okay. So what is the currently approved regimen? I will talk only about rivaroxaban and apixaban. Rivaroxaban to be started when the bleeding, active surgical bleeding has stopped. That is probably next morning after surgery. And it has to be given 10 milligram once daily for a period of 14 days in total knee replacement, 35 days in total hip replacement, and 7 to 10 days, that's what I follow, 7 to 10 days in trauma patients. The duration remains the same in apixaban. But apixaban is 
we start the next morning after surgery 2.5 mg twice daily 14 days in tkr patients 35 days in thr patients and 7 to 10 days in trauma patients okay yeah. next so to summarize all the doacs have similar uh, efficacy and safety profile compared to low molecular weight heparins but they are uh, much lesser uh, risk of bleeding amongst all the direct oral agents apixaban is very convenient because of its safety when we compare it to rivaroxaban as well as to dabigatran also it is safe to be given in kidney disease and that is also uh, a common occurrence in elderly patients it is also very useful or convenient from the pharmacokinetic point of view because the half life is 12 hours and we can if there is if at all there is bleeding which is very rare if at all there is bleeding we can just stop the drug and the bleeding problem will resolve and there is a cost advantage i think the i am not exactly aware of the, the cost of amboxan but it is very economical for the patients and uh, if you remember when rivaroxaban was launched uh, way back some 12 15 years ago its cost was prohibitive absolutely prohibitive then the cost came down but when apixaban came the cost is now much more in the uh, comfort zone of the patients uh, can we go to the last slide where we show the salient points of apixaban yeah so apixaban is a direct oral anticoagulant It was FDA approved in 2012. Mechanism of action is a highly selective direct factor 10A inhibitor. Factor 10A, just to remind everyone about the hematology, it it is at the confluence of the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of coagulation. Okay, so if there is a problem in either of these two, intrinsic problem uh, uh, leading to because of vascular damage or endothelial damage, extrinsic problem because of trauma. major trauma whatever it is factor 10a is relevant in both of these uh, cascades coagulation cascades okay so apixaban works as a direct inhibitor of factor 10a it has a bioavailability of approximately 50% half life of 12 hours another point which i forgot to mention is that it can be taken irrespective of the time that the patient has had food food has no effect on bioavailability antidote antexanac alpha is available uh, i don't know uh, how easily it's available in india it's quite costly but fortunately uh, we don't ever need to use dosage it is available as 2.5 tablet 2.5 mg and 5 mg tablet 5 mg is actually for treatment of established dvd 2.5 mg twice daily works well for prophylaxis so apixaban to summarize has a significantly lower risk of bleeding tendency compared with other oral anticoagulants like dabigatran idoxaban and also rivaroxaban which was the favorite till apixaban came on the picture next please <clears throat> yeah i think that's the last slide Yes, sir. Is that the last slide? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So uh, I am. Uh, um, I've tried to complement what Dr. Hari was saying, and uh, I think uh, we can have some questions from the audience to bring about uh, the more important points uh, which are faced in clinical practice. Yeah, certainly, sir. Uh, thank you so very much, and uh, uh, especially for bringing out uh, the facet of uh, shorter half life. of epixaban yeah. as compared to others because uh, we all understand we are taught in farm pharmacology about four half lives uh, the drug disappears completely so uh, if the patient bleeds uh, maybe disc stop or withhold next uh, one to two doses and uh, patient should stabilize on that uh, uh, and also uh, bringing out that the uh, risk of uh, bleeding uh with the uh, rivaroxaban and uh, dabigatran uh, if i've got it right is much higher as compared to uh, what we see with apixaban 
Now, having said that, what uh, one question which rankles to me is uh, many of these patients post surgery, you know, uh, would be surely on uh, analgesics and anti inflammatories uh, and uh, the combined use of anticoagulant, you know, and most of them uh, uh, maybe for quite some time may not be consuming any food, uh, you know. So, uh, there has been uh, the literature mentions that increased risk of even GI bleeding, uh, you know, uh, with with the use of anticoagulants and uh, especially when we compare uh, uh, apixaban with others uh, it is much lesser so have you had any experience uh, there that patient uh, you have operated upon and uh, apart from the wound uh, okay if yeah, I answer that, coming into picture absolutely yeah. no problem with apixaban with respect to post operative bleeding uh -huh. okay uh, i used to have that problem uh, as i said with the river oxaban where i was using uh, typically, it was occurring after a joint replacement surgery. Typically, it was uh, occurring on the day 6 or day 7. This was at a time when the patient was already discharged. patient has gone home. And the patient, in a panic situation, the relatives call up and say that uh, there is some bleeding or there is some spotting seen. Okay? This is no longer seen with a pic uh, Another thing I must also mention is the role of aspirin. Now, aspirin, as we discussed, uh, can be used. It is also a cheap drug. It is also an easily available drug. And many patients are already on aspirin, Ecospin 75 for some cardiac issue or whatever. Yes, yes. So in those patients, in those patients, efficacy of aspirin as an anticoagulant agent is more or less all right. I mean, as a maintenance therapy, it is good. Okay. But but when we are giving aspirin as an anticoagulant after an orthopedic surgery, the dosage is not 75 milligram. Dosage is 150 milligram, and therein lies the problem. Yes, because yes. at 150 milligram, the problem starts. There is uh, almost every other patient has got gastrointestinal issues, GI bleed, gingivitis, menorrhagia, per rectal bleed. All these things would occur. And the patients are not comfortable with that 150 milligram of aspirin uh, once a day. And aspirin, if we start it, it's to be given for a period of 30 days or one month. So that's why I feel, again, Apixaban scores over aspirin. Aspirin is merely a platelet inhibitor. Okay. So uh, it has absolutely no con uh, comparison with Apixaban. Uh, your your thoughts, Dr. Hari Krishna? Sir, that's what uh... The recent literature of lots of studies have been done in American Orthopedic Society, wherever uh, they tell that still aspirin has a role uh, in uh, uh, post-THR and TKR. But usually apixaban plays an important role post-TKR especially. Mm -hmm. So the post-TKR, every patient, apixaban is a good drug compared to the aspirin. So if you want to just for the lower risk patients, post-THR, because usually pre-placement occurs in young patients, so there is very high, very less chance of developing DVTs. So, in high-risk patients, elderly patients, apixaban plays uh, is a very safer drug. And every uh, even nice guidelines mentions that apixaban post TKR is the drug of choice. So, apixaban mm -hmm. has a bigger role uh, compared to the aspirin. But still, aspirin has a role. I'm not denying it that aspirin is not a regular drug for the DVT prophylaxis. But in low-risk patients, which are not uh, uh, more prone for DVTs, especially elderly women, uh, which are uh, more prone for DVTs, who are rheumatoids. There are a post a long standing duration of the patient was bedridden patients. So these are all patients which aspirin or more high risk patients. So aspiration alone cannot prevent DVTs. Even the yeah, research guidelines yeah. tells that even the patient post trauma patient is therefore in the home for one day. Uh, the patient before surgery to be started uh, anti antithrombolytic prophylaxis. So yeah. even after one day. So uh, maybe the, the younger lot and uh, THR, you know, uh, there is a scope. Uh, you can give aspirin, uh, mm -hmm. but you cannot ignore uh, yeah. the anticoagulant. Yeah, they have to go together. And if there is a choice, uh, then uh, the choice of the drug is anticoagulant okay. always. Okay. Obviously, because unless you, you have endothelial uh, damage or risk of that kind, you would not like to consider uh, or think much about aspirin. And as uh, Dr. Raut clearly pointed out, you need uh, doses which are much higher yeah, and uh, which do contribute to significant intolerance on the part of the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, even though maybe with higher doses, the efficacy is comparable. 
uh, you know but then uh, the other side effects uh, mm-hmm. they come in picture mm-hmm. and they take away and uh, i gather as uh, dr vid uh, nan raut put out that in tkr post tkr uh, or profile excesses are required for 14 days i believe if i am correct that is what yes, i said yes. right yes, it's correct it's 14 right. days uh, yeah. but i missed out uh, dr raut on uh, thr it was a longer duration i believe 30 days 28 days 30 days 30 days 30 days, 30 days. Yes. and um, uh, your uh, doctor raut has just mentioned that uh, first day itself around 10 pm he gives uh, low molecular weight heparin mm-hmm. and uh, next day onwards they are on apixaban uh, that is his experience uh, which he finds pretty uh, useful what are, what are your thoughts you also follow this yeah, yeah. there's we something also, bit different no i also follow the same uh, i give in the night after 6 hours after the surgery give lmwh from next day morning uh, shift to apixaban after pick seven no. we started uh, we see less bleeding from the showcase from the wound sites oh. that uh, compared to the lmwh oh yeah yeah any day and uh, it's a lesser hassle and even once the patient is discharged should you require longer uh, it's much easier uh, to take the pill and go it now somewhere I, if i remember during your uh, deliberations uh, dr hari krishna you mentioned that uh, 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 the need of anticoagulant in uh, i believe arthroplasty that is what you mentioned that uh, though it is not very frequent and uh, not people do it but uh, you chanced upon a patient uh, yeah arthroscopy especially arthroscopy, arthroscopy. Yeah. sorry sorry usually, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the yeah. arthroscopy usually because uh, it is a keyhole surgery we not much of endothelial damage happens but still uh, a, a case uh, and it's already reported in lots of cases uh, case reports are there but uh, after the surgery i also started giving apixaban at least mm-hmm. because usually knee knee arthrosis post acl surgery is common usually mm-hmm. hemo arthrosis post post acl because we drill everything and do ligament surgeries meniscus repairs and all but um, uh, because of the hemo arthrosis complication we never give lmwh and there usually comes under low risk low major surgeries so but still uh, at least apixaban can be given post arthroscopic surgery so that at least the, uh, you are safe see as a doctor we want to be medically medical legally safe if uh, tells that if a patient of arthroscopy developed dvt and if yeah. you not given and the patient developed pe actually patient admitted into the cardiovascular department yeah. yes, and diagnosed yes. reference because patient yeah. had pe so it's a serious complication pe had and patients has collapsed in the home and they got to the hospital and uh, she she undergone arthroscopic meniscus repair four five days back mm-hmm. that's it. okay so uh, can i make a point here yes, yes, yeah certainly sir you can come in certainly can i make a point here yes sir yes sir certainly sir certainly certainly so uh, i have spoken to one very senior medical legal expert and uh, in detail about these complications uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis as well as about infection and i asked him what does the indian law feel about these complications yeah we are taking uh, a lot of care to prevent infection and to prevent uh, venous thrombolysis but what does the law if the problem occurs how does the law perceive it what he clearly told us told me was that if a complication like infection or a weak uh, venous thromboembolism if it occurs the law sees that it is a negligence unless proved otherwise so it means that the onus is on us to prove that we have taken the Medical due process. care with respect to infection we are not talking today of infection we we'll just focus on the venous thromboembolism we have to prove that we have taken every care in every patient in a- every surgeon so as dr hari said even in arthroscopy surgery make it a point if it is available to use the uh, dvt pumps or stockings in the hospital if they are available yeah. and mention it on paper and also in almost every orthopedic procedure we must give oral anticoagulants for a short period at least even if the patient even if the surgery is a low risk surgery even if it's an upper limb surgery but definitely for lower limb sur- surgeries like arthroscopy of the knee any surgery on the hip whether fixation or a replacement and of course for the t- tear and tear we should use it and we should document that we are taking these precautions and are, that we are giving the oral anticoagulants which oral anticoagulants are to be selected the law does not specify that we have to go according to our experience our judgment and the scientific data that we have available to us 
that very much uh, decides the debate sir, because uh, so it uh, it's more or less uh, it's mandatory that irrespective of uh, whatever is being done a patient must be uh, put on a you know even a very short duration dose uh, what that would be maybe uh, what seven days kind of a thing uh, what you are suggesting yeah, three, seven days works what is recommended uh, as we saw in one of dr hari's slides it is uh, recommended for the duration of hospitalization <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think if you have started it, why not give it at least for seven days? Yeah, why not? Uh, because obviously there are lower risks uh, unless uh, there are certain other issues to be considered. Yes. Uh, so th uh, that is why. Uh, so uh, one question which has come, uh, I don't know how pertinent it would be, uh, what parameters to consider while switching from, let's say, warfarin or heparin uh, to epixaban? Okay. Like uh, so yes. The, <laughs> yes. The major. <laughs> I knew this question would be coming, huh, sir. Okay. <laughs> the major point is that oral anticoagulants or apixaban in particular does not require any form of yes. monitoring. Yes. But when you are using warfarin, we have to monitor the PT and the INR levels. Yes. The patient on warfarin, the INR usually in the range of three mm -hmm. or higher. Okay. So the risk of bleeding is higher and that's why we have to normalize the uh, patient's bleeding profile. I mean, we have to maintain an INR of say 2 to 2.5 when we are switching. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts there, uh, Dr. Hari Krishna? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. That's the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm getting some questions. So I'm just trying to read them out. Uh, specific tests that needs to be done or parameters, I think that needs to be checked while patients are on anticoagulant therapy. Any particular... Yeah, I just uh, mentioned thing? that INR, INR to be monitored. INR. And, but uh, anticoagulants, uh, uh, when we are talking about DOACs, uh, you know, the novel ones, uh, I think they are more pertinent to that. I believe... Uh, no, better to be on safer side, better to uh, uh, subject okay. every patient on INR. Uh, you should see the levels. If the patient is already having 3, 4, then you should at least be cautious mm. uh, if the INR is more. Because in elderly patients, usually sometimes INR will be higher. Yes, uh, yes. Please check the inner level, base level. Okay, this patient has one, two or something. Mm -hmm. Depending upon that, you can titrate the dose also. And for how many days? So better to have your baseline levels of bleeding, bleeding time, clotting time, and no, the blood no. pooping. And, no, uh, it's better to have the baseline established and then, uh, then yeah. in, indulge on uh, okay. the thing. Yes. Um, I think we have heard uh, uh, from Dr. Rout his experience with epixaban. And uh, he mm -hmm. says that uh, he moved from reveroxaban to epixaban in his practice. Uh, we haven't heard from you, Dr. Hari Krishna. Yeah, uh, so usually I used to do uh, give LMWH for all my patients in my yes. starting practice, uh, yeah. post THR, yeah. TKR. And, uh, but I used to have see, patients have bleeding more uh, wounds, so cages used to be there. Every patient to undergo three, four dressings at least. Mm -hmm. post uh, surgery yeah. so then i thought okay aspirin will start but uh, i feel that how medical legally safe i am if i am giving aspirin then uh, comes the apixaban so recent since one one and a half year uh, post covid actually this drug has become very rampant post covid yes. Yes. actually you should thank to covid yeah. actually because this product has become so easily available now with uh, low cost yeah. So, uh, it, it's uh, every patient can be easily because 2.5 mg is hardly cost anything to the patient also. I can advise for 14 days post care and post THR for 30 days. It's not be a burden for the patient. And I am at least from my side, I am medically legally safe that, okay, this patient I have given anticoagulants. So, this, but definitely, yeah. see, any allopathic drug, it acts. We all know that it, any, any painkiller acts. So, anticoagulants are going to act. So, so at least you give the patient because LMWH is to be given uh, inject injectable. So oral is safer and patients usually want to oral compared to the injectables. Yeah, but yeah, usually, yeah. Yes. Uh, post surgery on day one, definitely LMWH is a preferred choice you know, on the night because there is very, very high chance of uh, embolism at that duration within post surgery 24 to 48 hours. Then switch off to apixaban, which is safer and uh, less bleeding uh, chances. And now I'm not seeing any soakage of my patients because all I do, we do both, uh, both knee replacements, single sitting, no soakage usually in both wounds. And uh, should there be a cause for concern uh, with the shorter half-life, it can be discontinued and yeah. you know, the Definitely. situation can be tied over. Uh, it's, it's that kind of a thing. Uh, any more questions which are coming from audience? If Pompa, you can help me with those. Uh, 
Uh, uh, sir, I think we have covered everything, sir. Yeah. So, uh, what I gather uh, from the presentations uh, by both uh, Dr. Raut and Ari Krishna that uh, uh, most of the traumatic uh, conditions, surgeries, uh, we when we weigh benefit to the risk, uh, we understand that benefits, uh, you know, greatly outweigh the risk. And though there is a cause uh, for, uh, there is a reason for caution, but then uh, uh, we are very sure that we are doing and oral anticoagulants do have a place and a very good place and uh, uh, anticoagulants are far superior to aspirin. So somewhere uh, it's time we move on from aspirin, especially uh, when we are looking at uh, venous stasis and those things and uh, should be firmly with the anticoagulants. That is what I gather. Uh, I think uh, that is uh, any last words sir, to add on to this if I have missed That's out. That's what I want to tell any traumatic brain injury patients who are paraplegics, spinal cord injury patients, yes. please think about starting anticoagulants because there is still a lacuna in that area uh, where uh, still people never prefer anticoagulants. Uh, but uh, uh, the cause of death suddenly we also doesn't know. Sometimes they are died with brain injury or because of PE also. Hmm. So post autopsy only will come to know. But would there be a concern? Uh, would there be a concern? They're thinking about the ICH and those. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what, yeah. In our center, which are, we, we have a high center of neurosurgery as well as orthopedic department. Oh, yeah. And, okay. and we we made now protocol that every patient after the less risk of uh, uh, brain bleeding, then we are subjecting every patient to a pixaban. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which is a safer way and uh, not much bleeding also. Maybe the studies are required of apixaban in traumatic brain injury patients. Uh, yeah, those, those are that, lacking. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that will help uh, that uh, because 40% uh, uh, of the patients uh, who are going to develop uh, VT are, can be from the pa ICU patients usually mm -hmm. because of the post uh, immobilization for longer time uh, who requires multiple organ failures and all. Even lots of, see, that's what I mentioned in the slide, where the cancer patients are required DVD prophylaxis. Every patient of uh, liver, liver injuries, abdominal injuries, post-surgeries, general surgery, every, everywhere, every department, even gynec also, there is a need for uh, anticoagulants. So it is a very important topic. I want to thank Pulse Pharma to uh, get this to the all people, our audience, to know about what is the importance of anticoagulants. Definitely, it is very need of the hour that Every patient of orthopedic surgery, especially if I feel lower limbs, we should start them on anticoagulants. Um, a quick word from you, uh, Dr. Rauch, sir. Uh, of yeah, course, I mean, uh, uh, as he has indicated, we talked about all the important uh, yeah. take-home points from today's uh, deliberations. Uh, what I want to stress is, see, over the last several years, my practice is exclusively hip and knee replacements. So I don't see trauma patients. I refer them to my colleagues or my colleagues uh, operate them for me. There is a, a, a trauma patient in my unit. But it stands to reason that if there is a risk of venous thromboembolism in elective procedures, yeah. then there is definitely an equivalent risk, almost an equivalent risk in major fractures around the lower limb. I am talking yeah. of hip fractures, femur fractures, and tibia fractures mainly. So at least in these these uh, trauma, these types of trauma, where there is a high risk of uh, embolism, there is a high, high risk of uh, uh, deep end thrombosis, we should consider some form of uh, oral anticoagulation. Now, yes. in these patients, in these patients, if there is a tibia fracture, we cannot obviously apply a DVT stocking. Okay? Yes. Okay. So we have to rely on the medications. So judicious use of low molecular heparin. heparin and apixaban. That is my message. So use a low molecular weight heparin for one or two days after the patient is admitted. And then when the patient is stabilized, that there is no active bleeding, slowly convert to apixaban for a variable period. You decide the duration. Minimum is seven days, but you can go up to 14 days. That's very succinctly put, sir. Um, thank you so very much, sir, for sharing your experience with apixaban with us. Dr. Shari, uh, Hari Krishna, uh, it was lovely uh, listening to you. Thanks. And uh, I'm sure we all have gained quite a lot from that. And uh, I thank you uh, on behalf of both the Auto TV and on behalf of Pulse Pharmaceuticals. And especially it's been a very enlightening evening for me as well. Uh, you know, uh, we, we just go into the drug and we don't get majorly into the therapies and how, how, how well to use them. 
So thank you so very much for enlightening uh, all of us. Thank you, sir. And let me let me take this opportunity for thanking uh, you for hosting and moderating the session so well and making it so lively. The discussion was fantastic. I also want to thank uh, Pulse Pharma, uh, Pompa Madam, and all the other colleagues in the company who have always been with me, always uh, supporting us in every way possible. And I recommend that we should have webinars of this sort on a more frequent basis. That will sort of create an impact in the minds of young orthopedic surgeons as to how to deal with this burning issue. Certainly, sir. Uh, that is our uh, the basic intention is, and uh, uh, we want to propagate that and in a more scientific and unbiased, unbiased manner. You know that is what it is. I uh, thank you again, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Hari Krishna, uh, for enlightening us. Uh, have a great evening, mate. Right? Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. So, Dr. Pompa, can we log out now?